we've got a we've got a special speaker today. He he also has a a, a special task. His his task is is to look at state revenue in addition to his Senate responsibilities, but his task is to look at state revenue. And over a period of time, he and, and his co-chairman, Speaker Tom Murphy, will be making recommendations to the Georgia General Assembly that will one way or another impact everybody's pocketbook in the state of Georgia. Terrell Starr is from Forest Park. He's a Clayton County lawmaker representing the 44th Senatorial District. He was first elected to the State Senate in 1968. He served in the Senate a quarter of a century. He's a veteran of the United States Navy. He's a real estate broker. He's an insurance agent. He's also served as a Clayton County Commissioner. He's very active in, in civic, business, professional associations. He's a husband, he's a father. He and his wife, Celeste, have two grown children. He's, he's active in the First Baptist Church of Forest Park. But he's here today to, to speak to us because of his position of respect and leadership in the State Senate. And because of his leadership and respect, he, he was appointed co-chairman of the Revenue Structure Commission. It's called a lot of things. and. Uh, General Assembly, state government tends to, to come up with all kinds of, of names for all kinds of projects. Uh, but this, this is a committee, a commission that is, is looking at state taxes, fees, revenue, and, and looking at ways to, to either enhance revenue by, by taking, taking a tax that's, that's unfairly low or taking a tax that's unfairly high. And, and balancing those taxes. I'll let Terrell speak exactly to, to what the details of his job are. During his tenure in the State Senate, he's developed a reputation as, as one of the most knowledgeable senators, one of the most knowledgeable legislators on the budget, and one of the most knowledgeable legislators on education. He's one of the few, he may be the only member of the General Assembly today that co-authored both APEG and QBE. APEG was the, the education funding formula law that replaced the minimum foundation. And then QBE, roughly 15, 16 years later, replaced APEG. Well, Terrell Starr was appointed education committee chairman of the Senate in his second term, which is almost unheard of, and, and became an expert, if you will, in, in education funding has always been known as a, a strong proponent, strong supporter of, of education. I knew Terrell as floor leader for Governor George Busby. Terrell was the floor leader in the Senate for all eight years of the Busby administration. I always thought of Terrell as, as knowledgeable, as dependable, as consistent, and, and Terrell was effective. But more than that, Terrell was loyal. As you can imagine, a governor has to represent an entire state. A state senator has to represent a district of the state. Governor Busby oftentimes had programs or legislation that was not necessarily popular in, in the 44th senatorial district. But Senator Terrell Starr never balked at doing what was right. He will have to be listed in the history books as the absolute best Senate floor leader that any governor has ever had. I admire him tremendously and, and respect him tremendously. And it's my pleasure to present to you, ladies and gentlemen, Senator Terrell Starr. Thank you, Tom. He uh, put that just like I gave it to him. And I appreciate it. I did serve uh, with Tom a long while. We fought a lot of battles together. And uh, I know that he, uh, he would not have invited me out this morning had he not known my background and, and my philosophy and uh, know that, that we're probably in, uh, in good company. This is my first opportunity to meet with this organization. But I'm a little bit familiar with what you do and what you're about. 
I know some of your agenda. I, uh, I understand that uh, last month you had a speaker here, uh, Warner Rogers, our state school superintendent. I'm told he's still missing. They don't, <laughs> they don't know where he is, but I trust this morning that I'll enjoy a little bit of faith. And uh, let's, don't, uh, let's don't kill the messenger. Seriously, I, uh, I commend this organization for, and, and its supporters for your efforts to encourage public debate on matters of state public policy that deserve careful examination and deliberation before actions are taken. I welcome the informed, rational arguments of representatives from all sides of issues. And armed with these arguments, I'm in a better position to make decisions which my constituents have elected me and charged me to make. As stated, I'm not a professional politician, but rather a businessman just like you in this room. In addition to running my business, I have offered myself for public service and the people in my district have seen fit to return me now for 25 years in the Georgia Senate. It's my hope that state representatives and senators will always be part-time legislators rather than professional politicians and that those of us voting on matters of public policy are always in turn subjects of that policy so that day to day we live and work under the laws rather than making decisions in a vacuum as you might be prone to do if you were a full time politician. Today uh, Tom asked me to talk a little bit about the Revenue Structure Commission, how it came into being, uh, whose idea was it, how did it get appointed, and uh, so let me briefly tell you what, how it came about <clears throat> before we get into the meat of it. We have, over the years, had piecemeal attempts at, at revenue structure reform, and they usually wind up on a shelf gathering dust. So we introduced Senate Resolution 44, which coincidentally is my, my district number, Tom. I don't know how that happened, but uh, Senator Pete Robinson and I introduced it last year. And in creating this Joint Study Commission, <clears throat> we provided that we'd have access by the Commission and its staff to certain otherwise confidential Department of Revenue information. And I think maybe that's been the key to our success in that we have enjoyed an excellent working relationship with the Revenue Department, and they have opened their files as much as possible under the confidentiality laws to Roy Ball and his staff from Georgia State who is heading up the study force. And it's working real good. Our stated purpose at the outset is not a tax raising venture. And I'd like to make that crystal clear to everyone here this morning. We are striving for ways to enhance revenues if possible, but to make sure that equity and fairness is the key word in our revenue picture. How is the members appointed? The governor appointed seven, the speaker appointed seven, and the lieutenant governor appointed seven. Uh, we only have eight members of the General Assembly on this commission. We have 13 from the private sector, which is as it should be, I think, because it's a broad cross-section of Georgians. And those who are interested in, in seeing that government is run on a day-to-day -day basis in a fair and equitable fashion. The, the list is quite, uh, quite impressive. Uh, the, John Colson, many of you may know, who's with Alston and Bird. Uh, John Downs with Coca-Cola Company. Felton Jenkins with, with uh, King and Spalding. These, these are the type of people that we have on this commission. They're serving and serving well. The speaker, as you may or may not know, under the Constitution, all revenue re measures have to originate in the House of Representatives. And so, extremely important that the House be involved in this study. And I'm pleased that the Speaker has taken, Tom, an extraordinary amount of interest in this matter. In fact, he had just appointed himself as, as co-chairman and is serving in every meeting and showing real interest in it. That tells me that we can come up with something meaningful and positive and, 
We'll be sure to get a good hearing in both sides of the aisle because the Lieutenant Governor is committed to this process as well. So we, uh, we're off and running. You might ask the question, do we need a Revenue Structure Commission? Yes, and uh, let me tell you briefly why. For years, we've had uh, piecemeal tax reform, usually on a crisis basis. Think about it. An ill-fated, the ill-conceived exemption for groceries. For years, I have had the desire to take the sales tax off of groceries. I just somehow or another think it's fair and equitable that, that you not have to pay a sales tax on the food you consume at home. Uh, but it didn't work out. There was a problem with it. A relief on income taxes for the elderly in order to satisfy a court order about taxing pensions. The one cent sales tax that we finally passed here a few years ago, uh, the first one in about uh, almost 20 years, uh, which is a long, long while. We, we were the last state to really bring about any, any increase in taxes in the whole United States. But usually our tax reforms have amounted to just small adjustments, slight adjustments, and any reform commission has never really brought about anything meaningful, anything of a lasting sort. In fact, our income and sales taxes today don't look a whole lot different than they did 30, 40 years ago. But we live in a far different economy. In short, it was time to take a hard look at our revenue structure. Not only do we have a revenue structure committee, but we have a, a real revenue study, structure study underway. We've commissioned the Policy Research Center headed by Dr. Roy Ball at Georgia State University to carry out such a study and to provide the commission with the background it needs to make the kind of recommendations that it should when we're ready to make them to the General Assembly. The commission, if you would, has gone to school with this study and we're assembling a substantial amount of information which will be able to put to good use when we prepare our recommendations to the legislature and to the governor. <clears throat> we, the commission, are very pleased to date with our progress. We have had now five meetings. We have another one scheduled for the 17th of, 17th of December where we'll make an interim report to this next session of the General Assembly. Our concern, the objectives of our commission is this. Our concern is with the rate revenue structure and not with increasing taxes. In fact, we are asking the following question. Can the state raise exactly the same amount of tax money that it now raises, but with another tax structure that is more fair, equitable, and conducive to economic development? Our sole concern is with the structure of taxes and not with the level of taxes. If we can find a better way to raise what we're now receiving taxes, then the legislature and the governor can, can always adjust up or down depending on the needs of state government to operate. Do you have any preconceived notions about what is the best tax structure for Georgia? No, we do not. And we've told the Policy Research Center that we'd like to take a hard look at all of the options. No sacred cows. In fact, we're examining every thing from elimination of property taxes for school purposes to increased standard deductions on the income tax to a broader based sales tax and more but always within the revenue neutrality norm. If we recommend an increase in tax A, we hope to recommend an equal amount of reduction in tax B, so as to keep the overall tax burden the same. We do have some other rules we're trying to follow. <clears throat> One is take your time and do it right. Uh, we knew when we formed this commission this year that uh, getting appointed late, as is the case, we would not be able to complete a study as intense as we had hoped to, to by, by the end of this year. And so we're going to ask that we be reconstituted for next year and probably give our final report in December of 1994. We are undertaking an intensive study of each major tax, and then when we feel comfortable with what we've learned, we intend to explore detailed options as a commission. 
you probably only get one chance in a decade to do a comprehensive study like this, and we want to make sure that we, we do it right and make the recommendations that are needed to the General Assembly. When we come with a report, you can be sure we'll be able to support our recommendations thoroughly. I mentioned earlier the, the uh, fact that we're getting so much help and support from uh, the Revenue Department. And by the way, Tom, we, uh, we've brought Jack Morton on board, who spent many, many years, as you and I know, and is probably the most knowledgeable person in the Revenue Department, uh, as a consultant to the Commission. And he, working with Dr. Ball, uh, really put it together for us. And second, we want to be sure that we understand the relationship between our economy and the tax structure. We want these recommendations to be able to carry Georgia into the next century. It ought to be a tax system that can fairly reach the complex economic base and population that is growing in our state. Third, the work should be empirically based. We are relying on the numbers. If we say that a tax is regressive or that its revenue yield is stagnant, we'll have the data to back that claim up. Fourth, we will look hard at the experience in other states. We don't want to do what other states have done, but we do want to know what the experience has been, what has worked and what has not worked, and what are the lessons that we can glean from it. Fifth, we'll consider both the state and local government sector. This is a state government commission, but we know that it's not possible to separate the state from locals. And the local governments rely on, we have a common sales tax base, and they rely heavily on the aid programs funded from the state taxes. Now, what have we learned so far? <clears throat> We're really early in our study, and I can't give you any firm conclusions, but I can give you some first impressions based on my understanding of our results to date. First, our tax system is not an unmit unmitigated disaster. There are, of course, plenty to be fixed, but the basic structures are reasonably sound. Our biggest problems seem to be in the area of expanding the tax base so that all residents and businesses are treated fairly, and so that tax revenue grows in proportion to the growth in the economy. <clears throat> Secondly, we're still on a, a below average taxing state relative to the rest of the country, even when we take into account our below average income as compared to the other states. Third, we are very concerned with the vertical equity of our tax system. For instance, the way in which higher, middle, and lower income families are treated. Our empirical studies to date have shown us that the individual income tax is a progressive tax. For instance, the higher income families pay a higher effective rate. But the sales tax and the property tax are regressive. For instance, lower income families pay a higher effective rate. What we're trying to figure out now is what balance we can get between these three taxes so that the overall tax burden is not a regressive one. Fairness is a major concern with our tax system. Those who consume groceries and commodities pay sales tax, but those who cons consume services do not. This hardly seems fair. Those who hold wealth in the form of real estate seem to pay more tax than those who hold wealth in the form of intangibles. This hardly seems fair. Companies who use state services and earn profits pay more tax than companies who use services and don't make profits. Some will say that this is not fair. All of these issues are under study. Fifth, our revenue system does not give the kind of growth in collections that it once did. We think this is partly because some of the faster growing elements of econ economic activity are escaping taxation. The consumption and production of services is one example of that. The growing share of income earned from transfer payments and capital sources is another. And as we grow older, more and more of our families come to retirement age, we'll have to face up to the issue of how we're going to tax this segment of our population. The corporate income tax has shown more volatility than the other taxes as might be expected because the base is profits. The decrease in collections in recent times in Georgia actually mirrors that of the other states that have had a corporate income tax. The 
tax is a complex one, but fundamentally, it's not broken. There are several significant changes that could be introduced, and I emphasize could. Most importantly, the use of combined income reporting rather than allowing separate accounting methods. However, some could, would perceive this, these changes as being anti-business. Concerning the apportionment formula for the allocation of profits, Georgia may want to follow the steps of many other states in recent times and switch from a three-factor formula with equal weights for sales, property, and payroll to one that gives a double weight to sales and single weight for property and payroll. Our calculations show that this will lead to a state revenue loss of approximately eight to $10 million per year, and this is a disadvantage of course. <clears throat> But the advantage of this change is it may be considered desirable to protect Georgia businesses. Even though insurance companies are exempt from corporate income tax, they pay a premium tax that translates into a heavier tax burden than many other companies. The state government should be spending more resources on tax administration in the corporate income tax field. For example, there are probably many companies who are non-Georgia companies operating in Georgia, which are not today paying their fair share of taxes. Georgia at present has only four out-of-state inspectors to find these companies. By comparison, Florida inspectors number in the hundreds doing the same thing. This is an area that really needs looking into. Now, where are we going as a commission? We're gathering information on round one of our work. By the time we finish this phase in December, we'll know about each of the major taxes, equity, fairness, revenue responsiveness, administrative cost, economic development effects, and so forth. We also will have evaluated them by reform options, replacing property tax as a source of school finance, bringing services into the tax base, and so forth. Our next step will be to begin designing a set of reform options that fit the judgments of the commission members who, after all, are representative of the state's population. We plan to report our progress as indicated to the legislature this year and then to make a final report during late 1994 when we finished our deliberations. We are, we are pleased with our progress. We are pleased with Dr. Ball and, and, uh, and his staff. He has uh, a a group of about six professors that he's using this. They're just furnishing us with a wealth of information. And Jack Borden, bringing him on board, who is a former employee of the Revenue Department, was a, a real coup. He's, together, they're just doing a good job, and the Revenue Department is giving them the information to do the job with. So we, we think we're headed in the right direction. We hope you are pleased with our efforts, and when we get finished, we hope to have some recommendations that will be meaningful. A word on uh, where we're at today, a financial update. Uh, the reason I say our, our system is not broke, Georgia still ranks tall with our sister states in our bondworthiness and our fiscal responsibility. We always rank in the top three states in this category. And our selling our bonds is, is it's a matter of putting them out there. They're, they're, they're grabbing them up real fast. Whereas other states are having real difficulty and we're getting a much lower rate as a result. Standard Poor's and Moody's bond rating uh, concerns have really always ranked Georgia very high in that regard. We have had three years of downturn, as you all know. Things have been a little tough. And we have uh, literally robbed Peter to pay Paul and we've, we've cut and slashed and cut and slashed. And, and when you're getting one and two percent growth and it takes five, six percent just to really to stand still, it's, it's difficult to see how we've made it over these past three years. But things are looking better. We, uh, we've enjoyed since July 1 an average 8.7 percent increase each month. Uh, to make our budget for next year, it only takes a 4.7 percent increase over the revenues it received for fiscal year 93. So we're going to, it's looking better, we're going to make our, make our budget, I think, for this year. And of course, we have uh, skimped so tightly for the last three years, there still won't be sufficient monies to do the things that state employees, teachers, 
uh, university system personnel all feel like should be done on their behalf, but uh, it won't be quite as bad as it's been for the last three sessions. <clears throat> we, another matter of concern, I think, uh, to all of us who, who look at government and ways that we can cut spending rather than increase spending, uh, we have opened 23 new prisons since 1990 and taken some in, in excess of 4,000 people to staff these operations, yet we've only had a net increase of less than 1,000 uh, employees in the state of Georgia during this period of time. So that means we've cut about 3,000 employees out by attrition and simply by, by cutting back. So state government is operating on a sound, solid fiscal basis. We are in good shape. Our bond rating stands high. And so when I talk about revenue structure, I'm simply talking about just that, as indicated, that we want to make sure that, that the people are taxed, are taxed fairly, no one minds paying their fair share, as long as the, the neighbors are doing likewise. So we, uh, we continue to hammer away at it, Hugh, and uh, someday we'll get it right, maybe. It's been a pleasure to, to be with you this morning. Uh, Tom said you might have a question or two that you wanted to throw at me, so I'll, uh, Tom, if that's your format, I will, uh, I will now stop, and uh, if you have any particular questions, uh, we'll try to answer them. If not, I'll get Hugh up here and let him answer them for us. All right. Uh, December of next year. <clears throat> yes, sir. Well, this is a study commission and really has no, no bearing at this point on what our revenues will be for the fiscal year 94 because we will we'll not even be completed our study by the end of this fiscal year. So uh, for instance to give a one percent across the board raise for all state employees takes about 53 million dollars. That's university personnel, state employees and teachers. And uh, Teachers haven't had any increases in the last two or three years to mount anything. They're looking for a substantial increase. In fact, they're asking for 7%. If you gave a 7% raise across the board, you can easily see you talked about an awful lot of money. We simply don't have that kind of money. The surplus uh, this year is only amounting to about uh, $80 million, and we need uh, every bit of that to fund midterm adjustments and other expenditures that are mandatory. So we, as we're increasing, we're not flush with money. We simply uh, still have to be very frugal and, and the raises we'll be able to give will be very minimal. It certainly won't be what they're looking for. And our biggest expenditure in recent years has been in the field of health care and in the funding of prisons, as indicated. We, we had under court order had to build these new prisons and and all the new employees to staff them it really has taken a taken a big bite out so I uh, what we recommend of course wouldn't be considered and passed until uh, 95 and it would really be having a bearing on this fiscal year's budget anyway yes sir Well, <clears throat> I certainly concur in that, and as I indicated earlier, 
We have literally done that for the last three years in cutting back. We have eliminated uh, some 3,000 positions in that period of time and uh, would like to do more. Uh, I, like you, I'm not a proponent of big government and the, the least we can operate with is the way I like it. And uh, we, we're struggling with education, for instance. We've put an awful lot of dollars into education in the last 10 years, and there are those who say uh, it isn't working. You know, it, it hasn't, we haven't come up with the end product that we desire. But we, we have, with the teachers there and the salaries and, and the facilities you have to provide for them, we've, uh, we've spent an awful lot of money, and hopefully it hasn't been for naught. But uh, yes, I agree with you. Uh, uh, this business of uh, property tax seems to be the, the, the least desirable tax. Folks uh, get, off, get awfully concerned about it. I would, uh, I would love to see the state pick up the cost of education. However, uh, you've got to look deep into that before you do it in that are you going to level everybody down to a common denominator and not allow local enhancement, local enrichment? If you do, then are you going to help education or hurt education? And if you do allow that, if state picks up the other tab and some local areas enrich, then you're going to have a disparity in the quality of educational opportunity and you're going to wind up back in the courts again. So the question is very, very complex. And in our study here, we've determined that it would take uh, if you want to eliminate property tax totally for educational purposes, you look at at least three cent sales tax increase to, to offset that. Uh, do we want another three cent sales tax? Uh, I don't think so. Just to pick up a required local effort would take uh, eight tenths of one cent uh, increase. So there are just a lot of elements out there, but what you're talking about in addition to the tax study is a commission on government which we are looking at uh, very closely right now and reducing the size of the government. I know the lieutenant governor has been very interested in doing that. I would like to challenge the House of Representatives right now to vote on a, a bill in favor of this to reduce and do exactly what Jeff Durkin said, reduce all other costs of government by 1% per year. Well, I certainly concur with you, and, and uh, I would, I just wish that the federal government would take a lesson from Georgia and some other states and operate their fiscal affairs as well as we do. We all would be a whole lot better off. But uh, we don't have to say so on what to do in, in the Congress, of course. But on a local level, uh, we can and should and will <clears throat> take that into consideration. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I would hate to be a member of the General Assembly and admit I couldn't find out what's in the budget. Uh, then I don't think he's doing his job, actually. But uh, the budget is complex, and uh, those who don't serve on the Appropriations Committee would have difficulty unless they put a concerted effort into finding out what's going on. But uh, continuation, for instance, the lottery funds right now are ex in excess of what we anticipated. We had, we had uh, anticipated $139 million. We appropriated $125 million, leaving the 14 in surplus. Actually, looks like it may double that. But if we took those lottery funds and, for instance, spent them on teacher salaries, we'd be very foolish because you're going to have those salaries year after year after year on a continuing basis. So you want to spend those kind of funds on one-shot expenditures. Personally, I'd like to spend on capital outlay, uh, brick and mortar. But uh, 
you, the budget requires a lot of work, a lot of getting into, but you can get the answers if you simply dig in there. And when you say continuation, that's true. You got a, you got your state patrol, you got your prison system, you got your board of corrections, you got your teacher salaries, you got university to operate, and your ongoing expenditures are, are such that if you are not careful, they mount up on you real fast, and you simply uh, you run out of money. Uh, but I, I think anyone that really wants to find out can find out and, and should find out. I would simply say to you, uh, I'd make it my business to find out if I was in his shoes. Yes? Sir, what is the status of opening the prison after the legislature? As I indicated, we have added uh, some 23 facilities in the last, uh, last few years. And uh, with addition of some 4,000 in personnel. Now there's, a, there's some more that are ready to open and depending on availability of funds and hopefully there's gonna be some surplus funds, they will get them all open by July 1 of next year. Uh, that's money that just agrees me to spend. <clears throat> I just hate to see us spend all these dollars on, on prison facilities that you must build according to specifications or the courts require you to have a certain uh, amount of space for each prisoner, you got to feed them correctly, and you got to. It just takes an awful lot of money. It, it seems uh, to me a waste. Well, I'd like to be spending that on uh, on education and other human needs. It would be a much better, uh, long-lasting benefit. But I think we'll have them all open. That's your specific question by July one next year. And we we think we catch up. But we don't. Uh, our population is just still growing by leaps and bounds, and the prison population that is, and uh, we're going to continue to need more prison beds, and we're going to have to build more unless something drastic is, happens in our criminal justice system to turn it around. Any other question? Sure. Yes, Tom. We, uh, we're going to hopefully be reconstituted after the first year, and I'm sure we will be, because there's a lot of interest in on the governor's part, the speaker's part, and the lieutenant governor's part. We will be breaking into three subcommittees and uh, assigning seven, seven members to each one. And uh, it's going to be open. There'll be a, any meetings you well know of, open meetings, and, and we, we uh, want your input, want your advice, and we'll be having public hearings uh, next spring and summer on it. So uh, stay in contact with either me or the speaker or any member of the commission or any member of the General Assembly. Uh, and we can let you know when the meetings are going to be and where they're going to be held. And uh, we want public input. We want to know what you, the business community, is thinking uh, in regards to tax reform and which direction we should be taking. So, yes, we welcome your input. Any last question? Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure to be with you. And uh, this is your government. Take an interest. And, and, and if you don't know your senator or your representative, shame on you. Make it your business to know. Because they need your advice, your counsel, and uh, they need you looking over their shoulders to make sure we do the things you're talking about, make sure we try to trim the fat out of government and we get, get a handle on government's expenses. And that's our stated desire and we, we hope that we carry that out. Thank you, it's been a pleasure being with you.